We have not even to risk the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. We have only to follow the thread of the hero path, and where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves, and where we had thought to be alone, we shall be with all the world. Obligatory disclaimer time. Narrative structures are best used as a lens through which to analyze story, and while they can be used as a writing guide, they should never be treated as an instruction manual or recipe. That has never been more true than with the 17 stages of Monomyth. All a teacher can do is give you a clue of the direction. He's like a lighthouse that says there are rocks over here and steer clear. One of his students at Sarah Lawrence College, where Campbell taught for almost 40 years, described him as a beaming flashlight into the darkness. Joseph Campbell was an American professor who was born in 1904 and passed away in 1987. And if you've heard his name before, odds are it's because he wrote Hero with a Thousand Faces, which contained the first ever rendition of the hero's journey. And uh, on that, I you might say, just retired to the woods and just read and read and read and read for five years. No job, no money. I was on one arm and Finnegan's Wake was on the other arm and he spent just as much time with Finnegan's Wake as he did with me. It was in this period of intense study that a theory formed in his mind. It was a theory that would make him famous. In his book, Campbell outlined his idea, the hero's journey that he had seen repeated in cultures throughout the world. Is every hero truly on the same journey? Or is Joseph Campbell's theory just another myth? But although his version was the first, it was not designed to cater to writers, and so many versions followed. We have David Leeming's eight-step version from 1981, Phil's eight-step version from 1990, no, I am not gonna try to pronounce his last name, and most prominently, we have Christopher Vogler who wrote The Writer's Journey, which contains the 12-step process, which is what you'll find if you search The Hero's Journey, and is arguably the most popular among writers today. It's also worth noting that Save the Cat and Story Circle also had their roots in The Hero's Journey and are popular narrative guides. Now, I will cover The Writer's Journey version when I finish this book, but until then, you can check out Levi's videos from Campfire Technologies, as that's the version he covered there. And you might even see a familiar face at the return stage. But today, I am focusing solely on the 17 stages of Monomyth. Now, Hero with a Thousand Faces. I read it, as you can tell from all the highlighting. Yes, I highlighted it. Express your anger in the comments, please. And so you might be wondering what side of the fence I fall on in terms of this book. Do I think it's unreadable, often incoherent mumblings that won't help the average writer? Or do I think it's filled with wisdom and eye-opening insight that will change the way you look at story and the world? Yes, the answer is yes. This was an exhausting, word-heavy read. Ugh. It was written in the 1940s and it shows. It's also full of references to concepts of the psyche, prime among them Freud and Jung, as Campbell argues that dream is the personalized myth, myth the depersonalized dream. Myths and dreams come from the same place. They come from uh, realizations of some kind uh, that have then to find expression in symbolic form. So there are whole sections where Campbell will present these dreams and biasly interpret them such that they match the mythological point that he's making. You know, something I would never do. You need to know that this is a book written for the love of mythology. It was not written so that we could pick it up 70 years later and use it as a guide for our Zutara fanfiction. Don't at me. So we arranged for a publisher's luncheon. I said, I'd like to write a book on how to read a myth. The Hero with the Thousand Faces became one of the most influential books in the 20th century. And oh by God, I got a marvelous contract, $250 on signing the contract. So I worked for four or five years. This is not, and I cannot stress this enough, a book about how to write. But if you like mythology, are patient to and aren't scared of sentences that require a highlighter to properly dissect, this is a truly interesting read and I think it can expand your understanding of the origin of story and through that, the future of story. I don't believe in um, being interested in subjects because they're said to be important and interesting, but you may find that uh, with a proper introduction, this uh, subject will, will catch you. 
So let's talk about the journey itself. Whether presented in the vast, almost oceanic images of the Orient, in the vigorous narratives of the Greeks, or the majestic legends of the Bible, the adventure of the hero normally follows the pattern of the nuclear unit, a separation from the world, a penetration to some source of power, and a life-changing return. Joseph Campbell depicts the hero's journey as being cyclical, and of course he decided to have the circle go counterclockwise because apparently he wanted me to read it the wrong direction every single time I look at it. Now, the top half of the circle represents the ordinary world, or the consciousness, and it's in this half that we find separation or departure, and return. The lower half is the extraordinary world, or the subconscious, which is taken up entirely by initiation. Each of these then further breaks down into stages. First off, we have the stage in which the hero is separated from their familiar world, which is aptly named Separation, which begins with the call to adventure. This first stage of the mythological journey signifies that destiny has summoned the hero and transferred his spiritual center of gravity from within his society to a zone unknown. Now this call can come in the form of an event, a message, information, a problem, anything that pulls the hero towards that extraordinary world. And that world unknown can be entirely symbolic or internal. Now let's talk about examples. Now, I really wanted to use Blade Runner 2049 as an example here because despite popular belief, it actually conforms really nicely to the 17 stages of monomyth, but alas, Blade Runner 2049 has too much myth, and so I'll release that as a standalone in a few weeks and use it as an excuse to delve deeper into Campbell's work. For this video, I'm going to be focusing on the examples that are The Matrix and The Empire Strikes Back. Well, when I did Star Wars, I consciously set about to recreate myths. Stumbled across a hero with a thousand faces. Possible that if I had run across that, I would still be writing Star Wars today. You know, I think my last mentor probably was Joe, Joe Campbell, who asked a lot of the interesting questions and focused it the way I had once I got to be good friends with Joe. So in The Empire Strikes Back, the ordinary world is of course extraordinary compared to the last movie, but is now the normal for Luke, which is what matters. The call to adventure is the moment when Obi-Wan appears to Luke and tells him to seek out Yoda. And for The Matrix, I'm going to be getting some assistance with the examples from Levi, who is the host of Campfire Technologies. Yes, this is a collab, so I'm going to hand that off to him. In The Matrix, this is where Neo receives the message telling him to follow the White Rabbit a woman who takes him to a nightclub where he meets Trinity. This extends into Neo's work where he receives the call from Morpheus telling him to go out on the ledge to escape the agents. Next up we have refusal of the call. Walled in boredom, hard work, or culture, the subject loses the power of significant affirmative action. The myths and folktales of the whole world make it clear that the refusal is essentially a refusal to give up what one takes to be one's own interests. Change is hard, and so it's natural for us to shy away from it. So a hero can refuse the call for any number of reasons, from a sense of responsibility to the familiar world, fear of the unknown, insecurity, Sometimes this refusal is forgiven, sometimes there are consequences. As David Leeming put it, We all resist radical change, and the hero, as our persona in the universal dream, is no exception. Campbell argues that this has roots in the psyche. One is bound in by the walls of childhood. The father and mother stand as threshold guardians, and the timorous soul, fearful of some punishment, fails to make the passage through the door and come to birth in the world without. In Star Wars, the scouting droid finds the rebel base, forcing Luke to focus on this crisis and thus ignore the call. His relatively forced and temporary refusal here is important and common in sequels because it allows him to refuse without undermining his growth from the last journey. In The Matrix, Neo goes out on the ledge, but his fear gets the better of him and he climbs back to the window where he's captured by the agents. The resulting encounter with Agent Smith is a consequence of his refusal. Next up we have supernatural aid, which Campbell describes as a protective figure, often a little old croon or old man, who provides the adventurer with amulets against dragon forces he is about to pass. What such a figure represents is the benign protecting power of destiny. 
This protective figure is of course the mentor character who offers tools to the hero in the form of information, training, or enlightenment. And because mentors are often depicted as being powerful, you must also explain here why the mentor themselves is not capable of going on this quest. Perhaps through a flaw of their own, or because their time has passed, or because they do not possess the power needed. I think that George uh, Lucas was using standard mythological figures. The old man as the advisor. He gives him not only a, a physical instrument, but a psychological commitment and a psychological center. In The Empire Strikes Back, the mentor obviously takes the form of Yoda, who gifts Luke with training as well as wisdom. In The Matrix, Neo wakes in his bed after what he thinks was a nightmare. The phone rings and he's invited to meet Morpheus. Morpheus takes on the role of mentor here, and will later provide Neo with supernatural aid in the form of the red pill, fighting programs, physical rehabilitation, training, and insight. That brings us to the crossing of the first threshold. With the personification of his destiny to guide and aid him, the hero goes forward in his adventure until he comes to the Threshold Guardian at the entrance of the Zone of Magnified Power. Beyond the Guardians is darkness, the unknown, and danger. Just as beyond the parental watch is the danger to the infant, and beyond the protection of his society is danger to the member of the tribe. Though this stage can be a literal crossing of a threshold, it is often depicted as an internal shift in mental state. And these thresholds often come with threshold guardians. But though these guardians sometimes exist to protect the extraordinary world from the ordinary one, they can also exist to protect the wandering adventurer from the dangers of the unknown. The powers that watch at the boundary are dangerous. To deal with them is risky. Yet for anyone with competence and courage, the danger fades. That is a symbol of your own fear and holding to your ego, which is what's keeping you out of the garden where the Buddha sits under the tree and his right hand says, don't be afraid if those guys come through. And so often you'll see that these threshold guardians do not even attempt to stop the hero. For the hero being brave enough to walk between their guardian forms is evidence enough that they are capable of handling what lies beyond. In The Empire Strikes Back, the first threshold is leaving the planet, but that doesn't really capture the crossing of the threshold all that well, so I'll let Joseph Campbell himself give you an example on this one. That's my favorite, not only in this piece, but of many, many pieces I've ever seen. Where you are is on the edge. This is the jumping off place. In The Matrix, Morpheus takes on the role of Threshold Guardian. This is when Neo is offered the choice between the red pill and the blue pill. He takes the red pill crossing the threshold from ignorance to enlightenment, as well as from the Matrix to the real world. Next up we have Belly of the Whale. This stage lies on the border between separation and initiation, and also represents the hero's willingness to undergo change. The idea that the passage of the magical threshold is a transit into a sphere of rebirth is symbolized by the worldwide womb image of the belly of the whale. The whale represents the uh, personification, you might say, of all that is in the unconscious. Water is the unconscious. The creature in the water would be the dynamism of the unconscious, which is, is dangerous and powerful. The hero, instead of conquering or conciliating the power of the threshold, is swallowed into the unknown and would appear to have died. This popular motif gives emphasis to the lesson that the passage of the threshold is a form of self-annihilation. And the belly of the whale and the crossing of the first threshold are very closely tied because the threshold is the cliff overlooking the abyss. And it's at the threshold that the monster of the abyss comes to meet him. And it's crossing over it that brings the hero crashing into the jaws of the beast. And so sometimes you might find that stories merge these into one scene. Or that the belly of the whale is the result of the hero's failure to cross the first threshold. In his diagram, Joseph Campbell places both of these at the intersection between separation and initiation. He also states that the two rows of teeth of the whale itself are representative of threshold guardians. In The Empire Strikes Back, the belly of the whale is highly symbolic where the implications are not readily obvious. When they first land on Yoda's planet, you have the water swallowing the ship, but larger than that, you have the whole planet, covered in water and full of unknown reptilian monsters. And it's here that Luke's ideas of a great Jedi master and what he aspires to be are challenged by Yoda. This culminates in his going into the cave. In New Guinea, there's a wonderful, wonderful event where this poor kid has to stand up and fight a man with a mask. The man lets the kid win takes the mask off, 
puts it on the kid. He said, the mask represents the power that is shaping the society and has shaped you, and now you are a representative of that power. He isn't our living in terms of humanity. He's living in terms of a system. And this is the threat to our lives. We all face it. The symbolism seems to convey that if he kills Vader, if he attacks with hate in his heart, he shall become him and fall to the dark. Yoda then raises the ship for him, which symbolizes his emergence from the beast. This stage in the Matrix is deeply rooted in the death and resurrection aspects of this stage. Neo's past self, who is ignorant and living in the Matrix, dies. He then awakes in a pod representative of a womb. Attached to tubes, reminiscent of the umbilical cord, briefly encounters a doc bot filling the role of midwife, and then he is flushed away into the cold dangers of the world, where Morpheus's team brings him to safety. This entire section in all ways is a representation of death and rebirth. That brings us to part three, which is initiation, and this again takes place entirely in the extraordinary world, and it's about the hero learning to live within this new unknown. And this starts with the road of trials. Once having traversed the threshold, the hero moves in a dream landscape of curiously fluid, ambiguous forms, where he must survive a succession of trials. This is the favorite phase of the myth adventure. It has produced a world of literature, of miraculous tests and ordeals. Sometimes these trials are subtle and just test the hero's ability to survive the extraordinary world. Other times, they are literal tests. Generally, the hero fails most or all of these tests because they have not yet fully realized their potential. The quest is marked by trials, by confrontations with, and the defeat of our inner monsters. These monsters appear, as they would in dreams, in the forms that reflect social beliefs and concerns of the particular cultures that give them life. Each of these heroic rites becomes, for the literary artist, an archetypal form that speaks to our common human experience and lends power and reality to the creative work. In The Empire Strikes Back, Luke continues his training and gets a vision of the future where he must decide to heed Yoda or do what he thinks is right. In The Matrix, this is where Morpheus trains Neo to fight within The Matrix, as well as teaching him more about the extraordinary world. And true to this stage, there are of course a few trials along the road. Which brings us to the meeting with the goddess stage. Woman, in the picture language of mythology, represents the totality of what can be known. She lures, she guides, she bids him burst his fetters. No, that is not a euphemism. These are fetters. Yes, I had to Google it. The goddess represents all-encompassing, unconditional love, light, goodness, positive power in the world. So in modern stories, this character is often the leader of the rebels or the leader of the good side, or the keeper of some tool or knowledge the hero needs. This character obviously does not need to be represented by a woman or even a character at all. That is just the form that this historically took. The child is born from the mother's body and is immediately put on the mother's body and mother is the world. Then all images of woman later in experience rest on that. The meeting with the goddess, who is incarnate in every woman, is the final test of the talent of the hero to win the boon of love which is life itself enjoyed as the encasement of eternity. Though sometimes there is an actual test at this phase, more often than not, the goddess simply passes judgment on the hero of whether or not he's worthy of her blessing. And this is almost always a test of moral fortitude and is not always one that's passed. I'm not the one. Sorry, kid. She is a character of high credibility and respect in this world, and so her belief in the hero alone is a tool in itself. In The Empire Strikes Back, Leia has always been the closest representation to a goddess. She is royalty, the giver of love, and represents the more moral side of Luke's subconscious. But though Leia manages to make an appearance right at this stage, she doesn't really fit the goddess role in this film to any meaningful extent. In The Matrix, the goddess takes two forms. The first is in the motherly form of the Oracle, and the second is in the romantic form of Trinity. Both appear to Neo in key moments of his development and in their own way encourage him to take on his role as hero. Next up we have Temptation, originally called Woman is Temptress, though we have all collectively agreed to just rename it Temptation, as it is only myths of old that tend to cast women as representative of this stage. But of course, Campbell was analyzing myths of old, and so he said this stage represents the realization and agony of Oedipus. The Temptation phase is a test of the hero's resolve, and so it's an offering of some form of gratification. 
And as to not undermine the hero's growth thus far, this temptation is often targeted at deep, repressed desires, which is why it was common for this to be represented as carnal temptation in old myths. However, in modern stories, this is often just represented by the hero being tempted to give up on his quest. Whether that be because of a momentary weakness, too many failures in the trial phase, or perhaps because the goddess refused her blessing. And generally, falling for the temptation will lead to the failure of the quest, or will symbolize that the hero has not grown enough to be capable of true victory. The Matrix does not have a true temptation beat. Star Wars, on the other hand, explores this in the modern and satisfying form of the first part of Luke and Vader's encounter. Release your anger. Only your hatred can destroy me. Which brings us straight into atonement with the father. The goddess represented the mother and goodness, and here the father represents the enemy and evil and darkness. Campbell believed that the parental forms that most myths tend to take here were deep-rooted in our psyche. As the original intruder into the paradise of the infant with its mother, the father is the archetypal enemy. Hence, throughout life, all enemies are symbolic of the father. In most stories, this stage is the climax. The stage where the hero finally faces whoever or whatever has the most power and authority over their life, which is almost always the villain character. And often in this stage, victory is due at least in some small part to the blessing of the goddess, and so that comes with the twist. And with that reliance for support, one endures the crisis only to find, in the end, that the father and mother reflect each other and are in essence the same. I think few moments in a film better represent this moment than Mockingjay Part 2, where Katniss aims her arrow at the father's heart, but lets it find its home in the mother's chest, because in the end she saw that the two were in essence the same, something often explored in dystopias. In Star Wars, Luke and Vader face off again, and at this stage, George takes the mask off of Atonement with the Father and reveals that in this sense it is quite literal as well as being symbolic. I am your father. Lucas, at least in these early works, interpreted the hero's journey in an often quite literal sense, on the opposite side of the spectrum from what I'll explore in Blade Runner 2049. The Matrix is an action movie, so we see a lot of time dedicated to this action-packed stage. Here, Neo and the others are ambushed by Agent Smith. Cypher turns on them and starts killing team members until Tank overpowers him and pulls Trinity and Neo out. Neo is then faced with his decision between his life and Morpheus's. He chooses to sacrifice his life, and he and Trinity face Agent Smith and rescue Morpheus. And that brings us to Apotheosis. Now, when I first encountered the 17 stages of Monomyth, I was in college and I was waist deep in my biology major. And so I read this stage as apoptosis, which is a biological term which means the programmed death of a cell, which is essential for an organism's development and growth. To this day, I still read the word wrong every single freaking time. And part of this is that the term fits the symbolism through which we explore apotheosis, which often takes the form of a character dying a physical death or part of them dying, which is not viewed negatively, but rather as the only method through which they can grow and truly reach a state of divine knowledge and bliss. You die to your flesh and are born to your spirit. You have to have death in order to have life. Joseph Campbell describes this as the divine state to which the human hero attains who has gone beyond the last terrors of ignorance. When the envelopment of consciousness has been annihilated, then he becomes free of all fear beyond the reach of change. This is the stage where the hero is struck down and through some realization, stands back up and faces the villain once more, this time being victorious. This is where they discover the power that was in them all along. Luke jumps from the platform, choosing not hatred or the dark side and instead the patience to come back and face his father another day. Because he was made angry and if he had killed that man, then it would have been a personal act another kind of act, that's what, what he had come to do. It is after this choice that he gains the ability to reach out to Leia using the Force, which implies that he's reached some new level of divinity. In this stage, part of his identity dies in a sense. The Matrix explores this stage in a very familiar format. Trinity and Morpheus escape, but Neo is left to face Agent Smith. They fight, but in the end, Neo is killed. Trinity then tells him that he can't be dead, because she loves him and the Oracle told her she would fall in love with the One. He is then resurrected with the belief that he is indeed the One, and having conquered death, which was his final fear, 
he is no longer being held back and is elevated to divine status. Which brings us to the ultimate boon. The boon is simply a symbol of life energy stepped down to the requirements of a certain specific case. The boon is the reward of the quest, that which the hero set out to achieve, though in many cases the boon is not what they wanted, but instead what they needed. In The Empire Strikes Back, Luke was pursuing the boon that was defeating Vader, but he found instead the knowledge that Vader is his father and the knowledge of his destiny, and knowing these things will give him some control over them. In The Matrix, the ultimate boon is Neo's lack of fear, as well as his newfound ability to truly see The Matrix. He demonstrates this as he faces Agent Smith head-on and kills him. And so we enter the return phase. The full round, the norm of the monomyth, requires that the hero shall now begin the labor of bringing the runes of wisdom, the golden fleece, back into the kingdom of humanity, where the boon may be redound to the renewing of the community, the nation, the planet, or the 10,000 worlds. Now, before I break down each stage of the return phase, we have to cover a rampant misconception about the 17 stages of Monomyth, one which I possessed right up until my research for this video in which I actually read the entirety of this book for the first time in my life. You see, I, like many, once tried to use the 17 stages as a guide for writing, and I quickly discovered that there are just too many stages in the return portion. It just didn't work. And this is something that most writers pick up on because there is an instinct to story which most of us carry whether we realize it or not. But our true mistake was in thinking that Joseph Campbell ever intended these to be 17 beats viewed as a sequence. And although this is somewhat present throughout, it becomes a structure-breaking issue in the return phase because here Campbell lists three stages that despite being numbered, are technically presented in the book as being separate possible outcomes that do not coexist within the same story. Because of this, this structure cannot function if you treat it like an instruction manual. So with that in mind, let's talk about the refusal of the return. Of the trouble beats of the return stage, the refusal is by far the most misunderstood as well as the one that translates least well to modern storytelling. Campbell addresses it in a mere three pages, of which only one paragraph is generalized information about his take on the stage, which makes it really hard to analyze. While this stage can be interpreted as we did the refusal of the call as being something fleeting and overcome by the hero, Campbell presents it as a story ending beat that encompasses the entire return outcome for the hero. As Campbell puts it, Numerous indeed are the heroes fabled to have taken up residence forever in the blessed isle of the unaging goddess of immortal being. There is the danger that the bliss of this experience may annihilate all recollection of, interest in, or hope for the sorrows of the world, or else the problem of making known the way of illumination to people may seem too great to be solved. And the sole example of this that he presents is of the ancient Hindu tale of the warrior king Muchukanda, of whom he says, Muchukanda, instead of returning, decided to retreat one degree still further from the world. An interesting thing to note is that you very rarely see anything more than a hint of refusal of the return in modern storytelling. I think perhaps that's rooted in how interconnected our society has become and how influential the sharing of knowledge has been to our growth. The thought of a hero not sharing their enlightenment with the world is one that now comes off as so selfish and unheroic that it would in many ways be interpreted as contradictory to a positive change arc. Funny enough, Blade Runner 2049 is the only modern example of a full refusal of the return that I could come up with. And of course, the context to explain it is far too great for me to include it as an example here. Meanwhile, The Matrix and The Empire Strikes Back do not contain a refusal, and so you get no example for this one. Next up we have the magic of flight. If the trophy has been obtained against the opposition of its guardian, or if the hero's wish to return to the world has been resented by the gods or demons, then the last stage of the mythological round becomes a pursuit. This beat is sometimes very long, or it can be just a quick chase. But again, it generally does not happen alongside rescue from without or refusal of the return. So neither Matrix nor Star Wars has this phase. No, Luke falling off this thing does not count. For this, Campbell presents the example that is Perseus fleeing with the head of Medusa. And that brings us to rescue from without. The hero may have to be brought back from his supernatural adventure by assistance from without. That is to say, the world may have to come and get him. 
The boon is often heavily guarded, and so a hero may have just enough power and strength in them to obtain the boon in general, and not enough to then return to the ordinary world, and this is where they then require assistance from their allies. And so, as we see in The Empire Strikes Back, this comes more often than not hand in hand with a severe injury that prevents the hero from escaping without aid. In The Matrix, Morpheus and Trinity save Neo by pulling him out and then EMP frying the Sentinels who were attacking the ship. And this brings us to the crossing of the return threshold. Just as in the crossing of the first threshold, the hero had to embrace change and the unfamiliar, here the hero has to reassimilate and find a balance. The hero has yet to confront society with his ego-shattering, life-redeeming elixir and take the return blow of reasonable queries, hard resentment, and good people at a loss to comprehend. And this is where their change is highlighted. The two worlds, the divine and the human, can be pictured only as distinct from each other, different as life and death, as day and night. Nevertheless, and here is a great key to the understanding of myth and symbol, the two kingdoms are actually one. The values and distinctions that in normal life seem important disappear with the terrifying assimilation of the self into what was formerly only otherness. In Star Wars, this is the moment where Luke is lying down, injured, and Vader talks to him using the Force, and he replies, Father. Casting aside his denial, this is him assimilating his self into what was formerly only otherness. In The Matrix, Neo returns to The Matrix and weaves the wisdom gained from his quest into a message to the machine, a message that tells the system he plans to share this wisdom with the rest of the world. Which brings us to Master of Two Worlds. Freedom to pass back and forth across the world division, not contaminating the principles of one with those of the other, yet permitting the mind to know the one by virtue of the other, is the talent of the master. This is symbolic of the hero attaining balance between the inner and the outer, the spiritual and the material, and the conscious and the subconscious. Star Wars gets a bit more symbolic here. Darth Vader was a, a composite man. Half machine, half man. It can be considered the mastery of two worlds when Luke is given the robotic hand, which he accepts and embraces. This says in a way that Luke no longer resists the self-annihilation that is prerequisite to rebirth in the realization of truth, and so becomes ripe at last for the great at one mint. He knows that being like Vader in this way does not make him Vader. He can be of his blood, he can be of his robotic bone, and it doesn't matter because in the end, he's in control of himself and his destiny. In the Matrix, this stage blends into the next section, so we'll cover it there. And that brings us to the freedom to live. The goal of the myth is to dispel the need for such life ignorance by effecting a reconciliation of the individual consciousness with the universal will. When one truly masters something, there's a freedom that comes with that. A freedom from fear, which in turn is then a freedom to live. Though Campbell presents this as an entire stage, it can often find a home in a single line, a closing image, or the final paragraph of a book and it's meant to show that the hero is at peace. In Star Wars, there cannot be a true freedom because again, this is part of a larger trilogy, but the closing image is one that evokes a sense of balance and acceptance. In The Matrix, we see both this and the last stage represented in Neo hanging up the phone, walking among the people, and then breaking the simulated rules of gravity by flying away. This is a perfect display of his mastery of both worlds, as well as his freedom from fear and the shackles of ignorance. The outer world changes with historical time. The inner world is the world constant to the human race. And the problem of making the inner meet the outer of today is, of course, the function of the artist. And it's because my work has had some influence on people who are doing this uh, that I feel so, so proud, so proud of this moment. And those were the 17 stages of Monomyth. And that is a long ass video. Now, if you're watching this video to use this as a rough guide for a story, then you may also be looking for a place to jot down your outline. You buy a certain software and there's a whole set of signals that lead to the achievement of your aim. Such as today's video sponsor and their writing tool, Campfire Pro. 
Campfire Pro is a downloadable writing software that's one-time purchase of $49.99. It has all sorts of tools in it, from serious Bible tracking and world building features to the helpful outlining tool that is their endless timeline feature where you can make, link, and rearrange info cards as well as time those cards to other information. There's a 10 day free trial so you can see if it's right for you, link in the description, and I also did a video covering all of the features so you can see it in more detail and see if it looks like something you're interested in. And that was it for this video, remember to subscribe at least temporarily so you can see the drop of that Blade Runner video because it was so eye opening for me, so don't miss it. And thank you so much for watching, as always I will see you in the next video. Say you